Okay, our next speaker is Sue Wessler uh, from UC Riverside, as well as the National Academy, who's going to talk to us about enhancing election of women in the National Academy of Sciences. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was inspired yesterday by uh, Jeremy. This is great. Now I'm going to be inspired by losing my uh, PowerPoint. I was inspired by Jeremy and Wendy, Wendy's story yesterday. Um, and I thought it went so well with describing where we are in our career that I went, I got up at five o'clock this morning and decided to take 15 minutes and tell you a little bit about my path because I think we all have very different paths um, and, and none of them are um, straightforward. Uh, and, and since mine, this is a picture of the Hollywood Bowl and it's uh, July 4th and this is the uh, UCLA or USC, I don't know, I get them mixed up, but uh, the, the marching band. Real SC, all right, right. Um, I, I thought, <laughs> I thought that you'll, that'll come into play later, you'll see. Um, I, I thought I would tell you my story because it's sort of, uh, it, it, it's turned into a fairy tale. I mean, it, it, we're actually at a really good place now. Um, and I thought it would be good that sort of if you live long enough, things things happen, uh, things, things go your way. So my story actually starts in the Bronx, where I was born, um, to parents who, uh, I'm not gonna, like I said, 10 minutes of this, uh, to parents who did neither went to college. Um, and then what really saved me was uh, going to the Bronx High School of Science, uh, graduated in 1970, and I was a child of the 60s and 70s. Um, it was a very volatile time, uh, this was a, a, a march uh, of, the, of the three years I was in high school, um, two of them we had teacher strikes uh, that tr took away two or three months of our time. Uh, there was protests in Vietnam. Uh, my graduation, we boycotted. We didn't sit, r stand up for the pledge, all of those things. So it was, a, it was an interesting time to be growing up. Um, I moved from there. Uh, I went to college at Stony Brook, not, not very far away, because my parents didn't want me to go to out-of-town college. Um, graduated, but I convinced them to go there. Uh, after I finished that, I took a year off, worked as a secretary for a lingerie company in Manhattan, uh, and uh, then saved up enough money to go to Europe uh, for a couple of months. Uh, came back and started graduate school at Cornell in biochemistry. Um, that's where I also met my uh, now ex-husband, um, and so we were together, we, we met there, we were both graduate students, and that's when we started the whole two-body problem opportunity. Um, and so it was, we sort of uh, alternated between who I, he waited for me, he was a postdoc, I was a graduate student, he waited for me, so he sort of had a choice of where he wanted to go, and he decided he wanted to go to Baltimore, to, to actually to, um, to the, uh, the D.C. area for a, for a company job. And I decided, and then I had to find a postdoc in that area, so I found one at the Carnegie Institution. And, and just very quickly, uh, people ask me, when students sit down with me, they say, well, how did you decide to go, you know, to work on, I work on transposable elements in corn, I'll bring that up very briefly in a second. And they said, how did you decide on that? And I would worked on bacterial systems, I would worked on uh, gene expression in uh, in bacteria gene, gene regulation at Cornell, and they said, how did you decide to change? And what in fact happened is I wanted to work at the Carnegie Institution, and I wanted to work for Don Brown, who worked on eukaryotic gene expression, but I didn't think I was good enough to get into his lab. Uh, I probably could have gotten into his lab, but I knew that Nina Fedorov had just finished in his lab as a postdoc and had started her own program there. So I called her up. And I said, Nina, you know, I'm interested in coming out and working in your lab. And so she goes, well, you know I'm not working on eukaryotic gene expression. I'm working on transposable elements in corn. And I didn't want to sound like an idiot. So I said, oh, of course. <laughs> so, so that's how I decided on, you know, what turned out to be a, a wonderful career. So I, I often tell students, just don't take it too seriously. Just go, go with the flow, as they say. So I went from the Carnegie Institution. So one thing that, that was happening is I was... I finished my graduate career in four and a half years, and I finished my uh, postdoc in two years, which is very unusual for, it was usual then, but now it's really unusual. So I started my lab at Georgia at 29. Um, so I, and that's also in Carnegie, that's when I met the biggest influence of my um, academic career, my scientific career, and that's Barbara McClintock. And I had the wonderful good fortune of knowing this woman 
for the last 12 years of her life, and she was just a huge influence, um, uh, hugely supportive, um, and just just knowing a historic figure um, and someone I really I really loved, I really love loved. So, so then I did something that um, I never thought I would do. I moved to the South. So the Bronx girl goes to Athens, Georgia, and I thought I would wouldn't stay very long, but in fact I spent. 28 years there. Um, I, um, and fortunately, the best decision I made in my life is when, at, when I started there, they had a teacher retirement program, which was defined benefits uh, for, your, for your retirement. And I, where I didn't think I would stay that long, but I had no choice when I got there. So I took the defined benefits, and I actually stayed there long enough uh, to get full retirement, which is what I'm enjoying now, even though I have another job. Uh, so during that time, I uh, started a lab. Like I said, started at 29, got my first NIH grant at 29. Uh, kept that for about 25 years. Um, I, have, I then had my two children there. So what I forgot to mention is one of the reasons I went to the University of Georgia is because Athens seemed like a place where I could have a family and have a lab. And it was the commute. It would be inexpensive. I could hire somebody. Um, to stay home and take care of my children, that I, and I wanted children. Um, it was out, it fortunately it was outstanding in my area of research, which is uh, plant genomics. Uh, and what else? There's something else. But I, I just thought that it was it was a family friendly atmosphere, and that's what I tell a lot of women when I go give talks: is that there are decisions that you have to make if you want it all. I mean, one of them is certainly uh, the man you marry, and I'll sort of tell you that in a second. But um, you know, and the idea is you have to find somebody who is as interested in you succeeding as, as they are in themselves. Right from the beginning, I mean, that has to be clear. One of the things that, that wasn't clear and one of the things that changed is that that's okay, but if you become more successful than your husband, if you start making more money, like twice as much, it, it's not good for, it wasn't good for my marriage. Um, and that's really what one of the things that led to it breaking up um, was sort of his, him blaming me for being too successful. And, uh, you know, Anyway, okay. So we'll move on. Um, I, uh, one of the things I want to mention here is that I have always taken time to be with my family. Um, I was there for breakfast. I was there for dinner. Um, I just found that I work better. I'm trying to find the little button here. I work better um, if I have time to relax. I think better. And I think somebody mentioned the other day that we're all so busy doing all these things and we're just generating data and generating data. I try to give myself time to think about life and to certainly enjoy my family. I always take uh, vacations. I used to. I don't, uh, we t would take, this is uh, Becca, this is Nicole, my two daughters. Um, we've taken trips to Africa. We've gone to all, all different places. And it really has um, uh, re -ener energized me in terms of my research. Here's another picture of them. Um, and, the other, and I said I was in a family-friendly department. When I got to this department, which is plant biology at the University of Georgia, I was the only female. So I'd walk, and I really noticed that when I walked in the, uh, the, fa the first um, faculty meeting. And it's the first time you notice it, because it was a very friendly department. Everybody was very good to me. Uh, when I got there, the seminars were at 4.30, and I said, this won't work. I have a family to go home to, and they changed it right away. Um, but by the time I left, about half the department was female, and Michelle Mominy was our, our chairperson. Uh, so anyway, and I've had a really, really good lab, uh, several good labs. This is, was the last one at Georgia. But then something wonderful happened to me, and it happened uh, because of a very special man, Oliver Nelson, um, who was at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I uh, came to his attention because uh, I worked on a system that was, um, that was really the, I succeeded uh, I, I took his project in a sense that he had going in the 1960s, and I took it as a, when I started my lab at Georgia. And I essentially provided the data that showed that what he did that got him into the National Academy of Science was, was true. Um, and so he was impressed, and he was the person who, and I didn't realize, he's a very quiet, very quiet, unassuming man. Um, but he was a, a, a uh, dynamo in the National Academy. So he had incredible power. Um, in his section or wherever. And so he nominated me and he pushed it through and at a very young age I was elected to the academy. Um, that also happened to be the, the year I got divorced. And it was a wonderful coincidence in a sense because I was feeling pretty bad uh, about my life 
but about my personal life, but I felt wonderful about my scientific life. I sort of felt like, whew, you know, I got in before they realized that I'm going downhill. It was that kind of thing. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get this. So um, then something else wonderful happened in the year 2000, and that is um, I met the love of my life. Uh, and, but he was a gator. That was the problem. He was the director of biotechnology at the University of Florida. Um, and then, so what happened then was uh, three years of a commute, two times a month for three years, okay? But it was worth it. I mean, we both, uh, we both knew. I think I said to someone yesterday, we had experienced 50 years of marriage together and 100 years of life, and um, we knew when, when something was worth holding on to. Um, and this was, we didn't realize this was only our first um, trial. Uh, I uh, sort of, he, he's, he's uh, not really smiling. He's, he's just sort of grinning here. He never became a University of Georgia Bulldog. Um, always Gator, and we'd always have annual battles when Georgia would play Florida. So anyway, what happened then is that I, I tried. I, in fact, got a job at the University of Florida. I had a, I had a family to take care of. I had a daughter, um, and I promised her that I wouldn't leave uh, Georgia until she finished high school. Uh, so what happened is I got a job down in Florida and I figured I'm a National Academy member, they'll hire me, and they did. They offered me a position. They also offered my ex-husband a position because we, um, we sh had child, shared child custody. But they managed to screw it up um, in several ways. And so Shelley, my, my boyfriend, uh, decided he had it with Florida where he was director of biotechnology, was offered a job at uh, Claremont College as president of the Keck Graduate Institute in 2003. So for the last seven years, we've been commuting twice a month, um, or just about twice a month for seven years, back and forth, lots of frequent flyer miles, uh, too much of Delta. Uh, but the, uh, the idea was he found a place. So I knew I was going to go when my daughter finished high school, which was in 20, 20, 2010, basically. Uh, I was going to follow him. And so he was offered positions in, uh, at Tulane, and I was like, I ain't going there. University of Missouri, I ain't going there. So he, he got this position here, and, and I went out, and I said, I could live here. So that's how we made that decision, and I moved out there. Um, and this is the view from my office. And, and so I ended up with a position at, at UC Riverside because actually one of my best friends in the world, Natasha Reipel, um, was, was, ran the show there, uh, had just uh, had this new building built, and now Natasha, uh, Julia Bailey Sayers, and I share a very large lab, the three old ladies sharing a lab. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, so these are my daughters here. This picture was taken a couple weeks ago, um, building my... Oh, and that's what I meant to say. Is So uh, back as at Scripps College, we, we live two miles from each other. This is why I say when it's a real fairy tale story, it really is. We live two miles from each other. Nicole is in osteopathy school at Western University. She's going to be a doctor. Beck is into neuropsychology. She's at Scripps College. And like I said, we're two miles apart. Um, I had uh, breakfast. I had lunch with her on Saturday and dinner with her on Saturday. It's, it's nirvana. Um, damn. And this is the house we're building, um, which, is, which will be done in July. So, all right. Wonderful things. Okay. The other thing that happened to me last year was, um, and Bronx Science took note, uh, was I was elected Home Secretary of the National Academy. And, and it says growing up in the Bronx in a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment for five people. It goes on. I mean, it, it just, um, uh, I never expected to be an Academy member, never mind being um, Home Secretary of the National Academy. And I just thought what I'd do is tell you a little bit about, in this second, second part, a little bit about the, the National Academies and the National Academy and tell you about the issue that I really wanted to talk to you about because I'm interested in, in your ideas. Um, the National Academies, as, as, as uh, Judith Salerno mentioned yesterday, uh, are, are actually three, three organizations or four organizations. One is the National Academy of Science, which is the oldest, which was um, um, created in, in 1863 by, by Lincoln. Uh, there's 2,200 members. Uh, much, much later, in 1964, almost over 100 years later, the National Academy of Engineering was formed, about the same number of members, and, final, and the Institute of Medicine, which is earlier, uh, which was later still, um, was formed. And then there's the largest part, really, is the National Research Council, the NRC, and this is really the, the, um, 
grant the overhead that 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 uh, supports the acad academy activities. So what I thought is I'd tell you is what is the Home Secretary? Because uh, Shelley, uh, she's my boyfriend, is is like, yo, Home Secretary, bring me bring me some coffee. Uh, so it's a it's kind of an unfortunate name to have. I, I never aspired to be a secretary, um, but it, what what it, it's sort of like being the provost. Um, of, a, of an academic institution. I'm, uh, my, the membership office, which I run, is in charge of the elections. It's in charge of the awards, um, the annual meeting, regional meetings, and the memoirs of deceased members, and we have about one a week. Um, so the, the one that's really the lightning rod is, is the elections, and it's the reason that I agreed to stand for, not, for, to, for election, is because I, I love the National Academy. I've been involved in it as I said, since 1998, I think it's a phenomenal organization, but I think it's one that is, um, I guess I am being recorded here, but not saying it. Uh, it. It's one that, that, that needs change. It desperately needs change, and I think it's, um, uh, it, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Not too much. So I just wanted to give you a feel for um, the election process, and I'm not going to go into any kind of detail, but essentially... The, the number of members that are elected every year is determined by the membership. And every you know, 10 or 12 years, this number has to be ratified and it can be changed. So in the year I was elected in, in 1998, there were 60 people elected, 60, 60 scientists. It, the quota went up, and this is called the quota. It went up to 72. It stayed at 72. And, and this year, it's gone up to 84. And those extra 12 quota slots are specifically for diversity candidates. Okay, and I'll show you why this was needed in a second. I think real soon. So the diversity is 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 really it's, it's uh, youth is a major um, a, a lacking uh, a criteria of membership. So this shows the the average age at election, and so what you see is that it is tracking up, um, and it's tracking up actually now faster. And if I had 2012. Um, our estimates without the, um, T without the um, diversity candidates, it would be up here. So it's tracking up really, really quickly. These three were um, when we had a special, um, they're called, we, we had a um, spe uh, special program, I guess, to bring in younger members. And it worked, but again, the 24 hour rule or whatever, after you stop putting pressure on something, it just springs back to what it, what it was before. Um, this is another, this is over a long term, you can see that the median age at election is here, and it just has been going up since 1950. I mean, the scale has kind of expanded, but, and it's, it's like I said, if we go to 2011, it's up here. Um, the average age now at election, I think, is 61, so even though I've been a member for 14 years, I'm still not, I'm 58. Um, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's ideal for women who feel that they're, they're getting old as society makes us feel old, that if just get into the National Academy, you'll feel young. Um, it's just, it's just <laughs> so uh, it's the only place in, in America where, where you're young at, at, at almost 60. Uh, this is a really telling slide because it explained to me a lot of the problems. And this is from a report that was done by uh, a committee headed by Susan Solomon uh, way back in 2002. And if you note, it only goes to 1990, and the data gets worse. So what it says is that the trend um, of, of older uh, average uh, member is that more members are being elected at the later stages of their career, and fewer members are being elected at the early stages. So it's sort of like we could think of the goalposts, and the goalposts keep moving this way. And in fact, it's gotten much, much, much worse if we go down. If I, if I, and we're going to have this redone uh, so we go up to 2010 and 2012. Um, so, the, you can't really see this very well, but this is just to show the academy is a, is a complicated um, organization. Uh, it's divided, the 2,100 members are divided into sections by discipline. Those sections, and there's different numbers of members, those sections um, are organized into classes. So this, could, this is the physical and mathematical sciences, there's math, there's physics, there's geology. These are the biological sciences. There's plant genetics, there's genetics, there's evolution, et cetera. And there's different number of members, and this is where the election process begins. So the election happens, essentially, the, within the nominations or within the sections. Five minutes, okay, fine. So it happens within the sections. 
So, so essentially, it's, it's for, if you want to change things, it's really, really, really difficult because all of the action is at this level, and, all the, and, and as, as the person who sort of runs this, you cannot tell these people what to do. Okay. So this is just to give you an idea of how the different sections, how the age varies. So, so no section is, uh, um, is the same. Some, the age is increasing rapidly, others less so. I'm going to get to the, I'm going to skip this. The other problem we have is, is geography, is, is distribution, that a lot of the people, most of the people, it's a bi-coastal organization. These are the, the, the number of members per state. Um, and so there are many, many states that are not represented. Uh, I showed this slide at a regional meeting recently, and somebody came up and said that, uh, that Alabama wasn't on here. And in fact, in our tables, in our, in our book, Alabama isn't even put as a state that has no members. <laughs> so they were even left out of that. So what I want to show you also is that this is also a, pl this is a, these are areas that we have states that have passed laws or have considered laws on the teaching of evolution. So really, the, this, the, the, the narrowness of our membership is really affecting, um, in a sense, science policy in this country. And so I'm going to skip this just for a second because I'm running out of time. I wanted to get to what I wanted to get to, and that's the, the, bigger, the biggest problem as I see it, and that is the gender, um, the gender issue. And so here you could see the, the men in the academy here, and these are the women in the academy sort of going up. Here the number was um, increased by 30 to bring in the fields of computational, uh, computational science. And, and so the number of women doubled. It went from one to two or something like that when the males went way up. Um, this will give you an idea. And this I just want to point this out. This will show you why many of us are worried. And that's because the problem is getting worse. It's not getting better. So if we look at, this is the election year. These are the number elected. Remember I said there was 60, 72. This year it's going to be uh, 70, uh, 80, 84. The number of women elected. Went, and um, So you could see that in this period, over this five-year period, the numbers were pretty good. They were between 15 and 26% with the high point in 2005. 81 over five years. But over the last five years, it's, it's really turned around. And last year it was the worst the percentage was the worst it's been since 2001. So I think we've been talking about how things are getting worse, um, and, and this is really a, a serious issue. Um, and it's one of the reasons this serious issue is, is, as we've said before, it's supposed to be a meritocracy, and we hear that, well, you know, women, women have gotten into science late, and there aren't that many of us. Well, the numbers really show that um, there are in certain areas, many areas, more and more and more women. And this just shows the number of male members and the expectation based on the number in the field post-PhD. And these are women members. And so we are not rising. The numbers are not rising as the numbers rise. And the reason for this, I think, are those goalposts that are moving. So just as women are attaining senior status, the age is getting older and older and older. Um, I think that's one of the main problems. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to just end by saying that the problems are, first of all, the membership trend, that we have a narrowing of diversity, older, whiter, more male, and bicoastal, and it's this idea that one member characterized the, the National Academy is a working academy. We are supposed to be doing reports. We're supposed to be doing you know, lots of things. So the question is, do you want a Hall of Fame, which is what it's becoming, or do you want an all-star team where you feel the best people in each discipline? And it more and more is becoming a Hall of Fame. The awards, um, and I've learned something at this meeting, and that is that it doesn't matter if you have women on every committee, um, that women are not being, there's very few nominations for these awards. That's what really surprised me. And I think that um, what we as women have to do is even if we're busy, we have to get involved in this. I mean, it really is our responsibility to take, this is important, um, and we need to, and what I'm going to try to do is, is work with the membership to, uh, um, to establish more networks. And I think the other thing, younger members in general don't want to go to the annual meeting. Um, and this is where the networks are built. And I just want to end with one story, and that is at a council meeting recently, um, uh, one, of the, one of the council members said, 
uh, you know, I just don't understand this. Why should we bring in new people if they're not getting involved? You know, they, it's the greatest honor that ever happened to me. Um, and they, they don't even care about going to the, the meetings. And I pointed out to him, I said, look, I, one thing that's happened to me, and I know it's happened to many of my female colleagues over the years, is every single year I go with my spouse, somebody comes up to him and says, so well, what section are you in? Or when did you get elected? And you have to understand that at these meetings, the members have a white badge, the, the guests have a green or yellow badge. And so it's just you're invisible. And people just, after a while, it's, it's sort of you're fed up with the, the process or the system. And it's like, I don't have to take this. I'm, I know that I, I know my value. Um, so in just with this, that science is really atta under attack in the United States, evolution, global warming, and that, as was said before, um, and, and it's my interest to, to broaden the membership because I, I don't think we are bringing the best people to the table. I think we're only bringing sort of a, a narrow point of view and that we need to diversify the membership, certainly make it younger, certainly make it more balanced. Okay.